Hey guys, and welcome back to the Mud Studs and Skull Caps podcast. I'm Robin. And I'm Kelsey. And in today's episode, we are going to be looking at some of the tech and equipment trends of the last decade. We are going to share why people love some of these trends and why they hate others. <laughs> we normally start off with a story at the beginning of our podcast but i'm actually really eager to talk about this topic so i just want to dive right into it i and i also don't have any fun stories to share this week so just skip it all together and get into our tech trends our techie trends that have been going on so i realized that like the goal of this episode was to do like current track tech tech trends <laughs> and then i ended up like everything i finally ended up settling on and picking i was like oh, I've been using these products for maybe 10 years. <laughs> Not all of these products have I used that long, but a lot of these I have. So I just want to do a little bit of like research and try to figure out where this trend came from, why we love it so much, or why we hate it so much. So the first one I have for today's trend is the sheepskin pad or... So I think the first part is how do we pronounce this brand name, okay? <laughs> like <laughs> I have heard a lot of different ways to say it. Me too. So as I've always called it mats um, until yesterday, literally until yesterday, I was calling it mats. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, I'm going to find out the proper way to pronounce this. And it really seems that there is like, I did find the correct way, which I will share in a second. But um, there's a lot of different ways to pronounce this name. And it depends on the region you're in. Uh, but how do the original people intend for it to be said? So we'll get there. I just want to share some of the pronunciation options with you. Okay. Because I was very confused and it took me a long time and I actually ended up on YouTube with a uh, pronunciation teacher to figure out how to say it. It's a dangerous game you play. Yes. I, I've got the correct pronunciation because I found, you know, it's a German company, so I had to go to language of origin and then find it that way. But so there's mats, which is really common. There is mates which I haven't Ooh. heard that one, but you could like, so with an O instead of an A, Matas. There's also the fancy French version of Maté, so we drop the S, but it is a German word, and so the proper way to say it is Matas, like with an I-S, so it's like a soft A, Matas. Matas. I think I actually heard it being called something like that. As of yesterday, I had been calling it Mats Pad, so sometimes I'll, if I say Mats Pad, or Mattis pad, I'm referring to the same thing. Now that I know the correct pronunciation, I'm going to try to say it. But it is a German brand, and that's how you pronounce the name is Mattis. Okay. The trend that we've seen for the last, like, 10, 20, apparently this is a really old trend looking back over history. People have been riding in these sheepskin pads for, like, 20, 30-plus years. I think it just, like, recycles every couple years. We get another, like, spike in who's in using half pads, specifically the sheepskin ones. So the last 10 years, the trend has been the half pad on top of your saddle pad, right? Your, so it would go saddle, half pad, then um, whatever – regular normal pad you're using today the trend is starting to change more towards using those custom dressage saddle pads or like a custom full-sized pad that you can get in any color you want mattis has a saddle make pad making website where you can like design the craziest pads you want with the piping color of sheepskin color of the pad they look fun are you talking about the ones that are built into the normal saddle pads yeah so it's like a full okay. saddle pad you wouldn't need a second saddle pad it's more than a half pad you can also get customized half pads but the trend is really moving away from the half pads and into a full size either dressage or jump um, saddle pad and this trend really like started the last time around it came from the equitation world for hunter jumpers and the trend was to put the half pad underneath the saddle because it was a pretty look yeah right hunters are really trendy people um and then <laughs> <laughs> they're just like they're, they're really trendy and now we're going no they're very pretty it does look nice and it actually looks complete or like finished it just feels like a finished look i don't know if that makes sense that like you put all your clothes on. <laughs> As opposed to eventers who take all theirs off. It's like putting that finishing touch on the look on the look. You know, you put your air bonnet on, you put your half pad on. It just makes the look complete. It looks I don't know, your horse just looks fully dressed. The question I really wanted to answer with this trend is 
how are you supposed to use the half pad? Is it over or under your saddle pad? How are you supposed to use it? Isn't it like the dealer's choice? It's just however you're winging it that day. I know the sheepskin, I think, is supposed to be in contact with the horse because it, no, I don't know the logic behind it, but I've been told it's supposed to be in contact with the horse. However, if you're going to be using the half pad on multiple horses or multiple rides, it makes sense to have it on top of your saddle pad. That way it's not getting all crusty and gross and nasty. Okay, so I have been part of the over camp. That, like, that's how I use it use the saddle pad is mine goes underneath my saddle and then I have a normal saddle pad between my horse and the sheepskin and the reason I did this is like most of the time I'm using that saddle pad for support to I'm not really using it to change the fit of my saddle because my saddle fits my horse correctly usually using it to provide a little bit more like comfort to my horse um, and to like help disperse the pressures of my bony butt being in that saddle. Like (laughs) I'm trying to make everyone a little bit more comfortable. And I really haven't used it. Um, I stopped using them for a while because I had a saddle that fit my mare really well. And then I was noticing that she was just like a little bit grumpy when I went to get on and she would just show little grumpy signs when I put the saddle on. So I switched and started using the the Mattis pad again with her, which I actually had never used it before with her, and then started using it with her. And that little bit of grumpiness did go away. So I believe even just by putting the pad on top of the saddle pad, you're getting some benefits from it. The other thing um, is the concern with pressure points, right? If you're putting it underneath another saddle pad, it's gonna be then pulling and creating pressure points on that sheepskin. So putting it on top reduces reduces those pressure points. Because I have seen, I don't know if you've seen them, but some people do put like the sheepskin on and then a dressage pad over it. And that one, I don't understand at all. That one baffles me. That one super baffles me. I have absolutely seen it and I don't know why people would do that. It just doesn't make any sense. But if you're using it on top of your regular saddle pad, think of that sheepskin pad or the mattis pad as being more of a foam pad or a riser. You're losing most of the benefits of sheepskin. And that is why the undercamp exists. So I was right. I was onto something. Yes. So the design is actually so that it is supposed to be sheepskin on your horse's back. You're either using a full-size pad with sheepskin or a half pad. I know using the half pad with no other pad is a little cringy, mostly because I just think about the flaps of my saddle. Like, I don't want my saddle flaps on my horse like that. And also, I know my saddle personally, the way the flaps are attached, I'm worried that that would cause... No, I guess it's not the flaps. I'm thinking of something else. Never mind. I think it'd be okay. What were you thinking of? I was thinking of it's underneath the... the, um, Stir up, stir single. You know how like that little loop? I was thinking that would be touching my horse. Oh, yes. But it's not because there's another layer. So we'd be fine. And I have a synthetic saddle. So like I think I could do it because I don't have a leather saddle right now. I mean, I do. I just don't ride in them. So like I think with synthetic, you probably would be okay to do it. But the reasoning is that sheepskin actually really helps wick the sweat and it helps keep the horse's back really ventilated. So if you're cleaning these pads properly, rumor has it they're not going to get as dirty and smelly as you think because the horse just isn't going to sweat as much with the sheepskin touching their body because it is so much more breathable than any other product or saddle pad material you're going to be using. I call BS. There's no possible way, especially with humid humid condition I, I guess i'm gonna have to test this out actually to before i call bs but like i'm thinking humidity here oh no i absolutely agree with you that i don't think this is going to hold true in every climate i think it would probably no. could hold true in my climate because we don't have the amount of humidity that you do it's just like hot day cold day but yeah the rumor so i did i scoured the discussion boards i looked at different <laughs> reviews like i wanted to figure out what people were saying and every single time people said use it Without another saddle pad, let the sheepskin touch your horse. And if you are, know how to take care of the pad, you're going to be surprised. It's not that dirty. Your horse is not going to sweat as much as you think they are. It's going to really help with that ventilation. You're, you're going to be surprised. They, and there, this was a common trend. I didn't see anyone say, no, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't do this. You're going to regret it. Everyone seemed to be on board that you're going to do this and you're going to love it. And the rumor has it that as soon as you start riding in a sheepskin pad with no other pad, your horse will never let you switch back. 
that changes, it makes that much of a difference with your horse that they won't let you change back. And honestly, this makes some sense. There was a 2010 study that was conducted by several vets whose last names I cannot pronounce. Kasharwar Balatsis and... I'm going to take your word for it. Pahem. I don't. I can't pronounce their names. I will link. We can provide a link in, to, to this study. But what they were looking at was the pressure distribution of different saddle pad materials at the walk and the trot. And what they found was reindeer fur was the best material. That reindeer fur pads distributed the pressure the best on the horse's back compared to gel, foam, or leather pads. Who's going to tell Santa? I write, <laughs> hey, Rudolph, <laughs> come here. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I think we can settle that sheepskin is a close second, that it's most similar to reindeer fur. Um, and part of that is because, right, it's a natural fiber. It's, it's, right, it's still a fur skin uh, material combination. So it does a great job of distributing that pressure for the, the saddle. And they use pressure maps on the horse. So you could, they had some photos of the difference between a normal saddle pad and a sheepskin, or in this case, a reindeer fur saddle pad, and that there was a lot less pressure on that horse's back with the sheepskin. So it makes sense that horses really seem to like the sheepskin um, on their backs more than uh, regular saddle pads. It does make sense. I get it. If you do decide to go this route, the one thing you'll want to make sure is that you are buying a quality sheepskin pad, that you recognize that there is going to be a difference between real sheepskin and fake sheepskin, and that the pad needs to have an open gullet design, that you need to be able to keep the pressure off that horse's spine so that they can move and use their spine and aren't getting pulled. So this is, I do have one sheepskin pad that I really love. It's really pretty. Um, but it's gullets not cleared out. So you just have to really make sure that that pad is not putting additional pressure on the horse's back. Um, there's a lot of brand loyalty around Mattis pads. People really seem to love them. But when push comes to shove, Fleece Works and Thinline also get a lot of praise over the Mattis pads because they seem to have a little bit thicker sheepskin um, that's a little bit more padded and they don't mat as much as the Mattis pads. I mean, I have a thin line pad and I've had th- Mattis pads in the past and my thin line is probably coming up on 10 years old somewhere in there and it's it's finally falling apart where I need to get a new one while having both of them I didn't really see a huge difference they both worked and did the job correctly that they're supposed to be doing at the time yeah and that's the other conclusion there does seem to be a lot of like they're all the same and then there does seem to be a little bit that fleece works or thin line are better. So there was never like Matt is, is better than Fleece Works or Thin Line. No one ever went that route. They always went through either all the same or Fleece Works and Thin Line are a little bit better for a little less money. Okay. So this is w- one of those trends where I think the money is absolutely worth it because as you mentioned, that's a 10 year old pad. I know I have several Mattis pads that I'm still using that are 10 years old as well. Um, they have not yet been used um, adjacent to my horse's skin. But um, starting tomorrow, I'm going to be trying this. I'm going to pull my saddle pad and I'm going to try riding her in the Mattis and see what she says. Yeah, do it. It's also supposed to help. Um, it relieves pressure. It does a really good job of distributing heat on their back. And it also is supposedly one of the best non-slip saddle pad materials. And we have some friction issues on her back right now that I have been trying to um, deal with. She got some bumps from the pad irritating her back. So all of those sound really good to me. Try it and then come back and tell us how it all works. Like if it actually has made a difference, if you can even tell if it's made a difference. And if you figure out how to properly clean it. Yeah, so properly cleaning it they, is you have to let it dry after you ride and then stiff brush it really good to kind of fluff everything up and get the dirt off. Your horse should be moderately clean. If they're filthy, don't do this that day. Maybe throw a baby pad on just for the day. And people were saying they usually don't wash them any more than like every two months, even with regular use. So I think if you're taking proper care of it, you're going to see this pad last a long time and lots of benefits. I actually, yeah, I found that even though this trend is super old, I think a lot of us are doing it wrong by using our half pads on top um, and just not being aware that like you need to invest the money in a quality product. So that actually kind of segues me into one of the topics that I picked in which 
there it's been around for a long time but people kind of always keep the half pad on top of other saddle pads because that's what everyone else is doing and that's what they constantly see and was constantly portrayed and i can almost guarantee you when you see a person that's riding only with the half pad or only with the, like the sheepskin pad underneath their saddle and nothing else people look at them funky and give them weird looks oh yeah my eyes get huge because i'm like no it's gonna be dirty right yeah exactly you judge the people because you're just not used to seeing it so what one of the ones that i picked was the five point breastplates mm. and this is a trend that came around probably 15 years ago in which there's always been your traditional hunt breastplates where you have the three point where it connects to your d-rings and then you have a connection to the girth underneath the horse Mm-hmm. And then five point breastplates really seem just to all of a sudden sweep the market up in storm where you saw absolutely everyone was using them, still are using them. And you see all these top level eventers that are, you know, are doing rigorous activities with their horses, big jumps. And all these people are using five point breastplates. And for the life of me, I can never figure out why. And I even jumped on the trend, too, because I everyone else was doing it and it looked pretty. They the five points are in so many different colors. They have the elastic straps to them. It makes sense. It has more points to connect to your saddle to stabilize it and hold it onto your horse. And I have had probably two, neither of which really worked on my horse. Turns out I was not adjusting them correctly. But I always noticed that my horse had a hard time like moving their shoulder with it or not necessarily moving their shoulder, but they always kind of seem resistant to moving with it. And they would commonly drop their knees or drop their shoulder when jumping, looking into it to figure out why. And it's because of the way five point breastplates are designed to keep your saddle in place. So to start off, there's like several different kinds of breastplates. You have a polo breastplate, which is just a strap that goes around the front of their chest. And then it has a leather strap that goes over the neck and kind of closer to the weather to keep it at the right height. Typically one loop on each side that attaches back to the girth, but it doesn't connect uh, in between the front legs to the girth. And then you have your hunting breastplate, which is your traditional three-point, five-point breastplate that we always see being used. The other one that you have is also a loop breastplate, which is kind of like the polo breastplate, but it just doesn't have the, um, uh, like a single strip of leather that loops around the front of the chest and connects to the girth. There's nothing holding it up, and it's kind of hit or miss with that one. I think those are more Western-y, though. Like, I see a lot of Western riders using that kind. Yeah, I see a lot more there, but fox hunting, jumpers, eventers, hunter jumpers, you see using the five point breastplates. And so the way the five point is designed to keep your saddle in place is with the forward motion of the shoulder. And if you think about how your five point breastplate sits across the horse's body is that it sits against the shoulder. And so every time your horse takes a step forward is it uses that action or every time a horse jumps over the jump is it uses that action to pull the saddle back up and into place. And so if you have a little bit of space in between your breastplate and your horse's shoulder, the saddle is going to slip back until that forward motion pulls it forward. They started putting um, elastic inserts into these breastplates to make it so they had shoulder relief. But in reality, the breastplate isn't going to do its action until that elastic is stretched. And now it, once again, it's using the motion of the shoulder to pull it forward. Oh, how bizarre. Like that seems all I'm thinking of is your saddle being pulled against the horse's hair the entire time. It is. And it also will frequently pull the saddle down against the withers. And it'll have that contradiction where you want your saddle, obviously, above the withers. And you want plenty of wither clearance. And yet the action of the five point pulls your saddle down against the grain of the hair, against the horse's movement. And it will create pressure against the withers sometimes. I, yeah, I had no idea that's how they were working. And that just seems cringy to hear that. <laughs> like, ugh, I don't, that just sounds painful and uncomfortable. Exactly. It is so uncomfortable. And I, I noticed it when I was using my own was that my horse didn't seem to like it. And I couldn't figure out why. And she was always dropping her shoulder and her legs over the jumps. Breastplate that I prefer is the polo breastplate. And here's where I get annoyed with the trend and kind of annoyed with the market. Is that, do you know how hard it is to find a polo breastplate from any type of reputable company? It is so freaking difficult. And you're always limited in your options. Whereas go online and search up a five-point breastplate. And you can find it at so many different brands and places you have all these different options you can have it in black havana brown light brown you have so many different options you can have pure leather you can have sheepskin attached to it you Mm -hmm. have so many different options that it's so much easier to get a five point that you feel that you can adjust to your horse when in reality you can't like it's just so much more difficult and pull a breastplates they are there but no one's really done any work to bring them along and improve them they're just the same style that they've been for the last 20 years like the only way to find them is you have i think there's 
like silverfoxhunting.com and then Stateline Tax sells them. Otherwise, you can't find them anywhere else. It's so difficult to find that style of breastplate. Are these different than the... I'm trying to picture what a polo breastplate is because then when I just Googled it, I'm getting the none finer ones. And did it... We had one. Are you saying we've had two? Sarah's used to run in them, and Dublin ran in one for a while. Is that what you're yes. talking about? Okay. I know that doesn't help the listener. <laughs> no, it doesn't help them at all. I'll read a description to you. Um, polo breastplate. This is the breastplate that comes perpendicular around the shoulder with a neck strap above and fastens with a loop around the girth. Does that help? Because that's the only description it has. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean... Yes, no, it helps. It helps. I understand which one we're talking about now. I just had to do a Google, a quick Google image. Because, yeah, you're right. There's not a ton. I remember we did a search a few weeks ago trying to find that one mysterious uh, breastplate that yes. we saw in a clinic. And I found some kind of similar, but from companies I might never support. So Exactly. It's so hard to find them. You, even you're t- doing a Google search right now trying to find them hardly any options like there's none of them out there and all the ones that you find they're not quite what you're looking for because they're the designs from 20 years ago because no one has done any improvements because the five point everyone buys it everyone wants that one everyone's using it so everyone keeps wanting to use it and they're investing money and producing new versions of it and making it appear more friendly and more I, i don't know they just it's so much it's saturated the market with it well this is something that like when I was doing and trying to look into some of these current trends and doing a little bit of research, and this really came um, up in the next item I'm going to talk about, there just is zero research into any of these products. Like, that's just not how the horse market works. Companies design a product and then continue to redesign and redesign and redesign and never once stop to do any research to support their design. That it's no. so hard to find, like, good actual scientific papers that say yes this product's working or no this product doesn't work yet you hear all of these claims one way or the other and it's really really frustrating it bothers me so many times that i see all these products out on the market and you always see oh this new scientific design but that scientific design is never really backed up by scientific research no i it's really frustrating i I definitely agree um with that Yeah, and so I just want to really quickly explain how the polo breastplate works in that I think some might be a little bit hesitant to use it because the polo breastplate goes, it's just essentially like a loop of leather that goes straight around their chest and connects back to the girth with another strap of leather that goes over the top of their neck, holding it at the right height. And the way it works is it directly opposes the action of the shoulder. And so it's not using the motion of the shoulder to pull the saddle back into place. It has a constant pressure against the horse's chest And is distributing that pressure across their chest to always keep the saddle where it is. And it doesn't have to wait until the saddle slips back to start holding it into place. And so its function is not based off of the horse's movement. It's based off of the horse's body. I mean, no, that's actually how I thought all breast collars work, right? Is they just provide it in, you know, at a certain point, adjusted correctly, it applies pressure to the chest and the tack can't go any further back. It seems really strange that we thought that design wouldn't work anymore. And that we needed to change to this five-point design. Well, I think the five-point design became so popular because it has so many more um, points of connection, right? It seems so much more sturdy because it connects in five places, five points. I also only realized today that's what the five-point meant. So I apologize, folks. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, because you have your three-point only connects in three places. Five-point connects in five places. And your polo breast collar really only connects in two. And so people went towards that, the five-point style because it just, it seems like it would be more stable, right? You have five points of connection. It's definitely going to hold my saddle in place better than two or three. Makes sense. Like, I, I buy that logic. I buy that logic. And it wouldn't right be pulling just on the girth. Because, right, you start to think, well, maybe my polo, one, the girth is going to get pulled and my saddle is going to get pulled at a weird angle. In fact, the way the polo breastplate works is that it doesn't have that same downward action. It's not using the shoulders movement. So it's not pulling the saddle directly against the withers like the five point will sometimes do. And it's not always that it pulls it directly against the withers, but no matter what five point you're using, no matter how you adjust it and have it placed on your horse, is it is using the shoulders action to pull the saddle back into place and keep it there. Sorry, I got really worked up about that one because that's a trend that I fell, I fell to. I ate it up, believed it 100%, bought two, and was totally into it. And now going back, I kind of want to kick myself and be like, do more research before you fall into the tack trend. 
Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I mean, and this brings us to my second item, which is girths. Oh, okay. Uh, specifically, today I'm going to be talking about the total saddle fit girth. And this is one where people either love it or hate it. But guys, there's no research to support claims in either direction. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> that. this is where I found it so frustrating is people either love or hate this girth, right? One of the biggest things that I have heard, and this comes from very credible people, including vets and saddle fitters, is throw that girth away. Get it away from your horse because it applies too much pressure to the base of the horse's stomach. And these are credible people telling me this, but I have a really hard time understanding this claim. If you think about the anatomy of your horse, your horse is not a perfect cylinder. They are not round. That girth is not applying pressure evenly, no matter what girth you're using. A horse is flat on the bottom of their barrel. And so that is where the girth, all girths, will apply more pressure. Then your horse, typical horses, if you've got a fat horse, maybe not so much, but typical horses then kind of cave away and are, there's like, a gap right behind their elbows because, right, their legs need to be able to move on that plane. And then they kind of get bigger again um, up towards where the billets and the stirrup or the saddle flap would be. So that's why I've always been told to check your girth tightness lower down to make sure you haven't over tightened your cinch. Just because you can still get your hand up high doesn't necessarily mean you aren't like pinching your horse's, (laughs) horse's stomach. So this is something that, like, I've never quite understood. So yesterday's trend with girths was to just have a little bit of a cutout behind the elbow. The girth was just gently shaped. Um, And then today's trend, we're getting more and more uh, anatomical or ergonomic with these designs to a point where some of these designs are a little crazy. Like which ones? That Steuben girth. I just, I keep going all directions with that Steuben girth. And we... (laughs) That girth has so much going on with it. There's just so much happening. So much and to the point where like, I don't know that that girth is going to work the way they say it does. Like I I was so on board and we're talking about this Steuben, um, I think it's called the Equisoft Fit. Yeah, Steuben Equisoft girth. They have a dressage one, which I think is probably okay. We probably can get away with using that shorter girth. It's the full sized girth that I'm concerned about. The main reason I'm actually concerned about that girth and why I think I actually won't buy it, even though I was super on board a minute ago, is because what's more comfortable, a wide belt or a narrow belt? Think about how pressure is, pressure points work. If you have a very narrow area to disperse that pressure, it's going to be a lot more painful than if you have a wider area. So when I look at that Steuben girth and I look at It's applying all its pressure directly towards the chest, and then it has those straps going up to the billets. And I'm thinking those straps have to be applying pressure in a very concentrated area. Or am I crazy? No, I'm looking at it right now. I So I I don't 100% mind the shorter dressage girth. I think it looks funky, but I, I I can see where they're coming from with it. But looking at the full size one, what are they doing? It's, it's, you know, like they just extended a dressage saddle's billets out. And that's a big no-no, guys. Like your dressage billets, your girth should only be like maybe three inches, three to four inches below your flap. You shouldn't be extending those billets down because that causes pressure. So while I initially loved that girth and thought it would be really cool to try, I'm going to walk away from that one. I'm going to pass on that one. Maybe the dressage girth, but not the full-sized girth. No, I 100% agree. It's so I I wish I had the funds and the ability to buy so many of these products and just try them. Like going back to the all the different breastplates that they have out there, like I, there's so many they're coming out with now that they're trying to like mesh, you know, the five point with the polo breastplate and stuff. Like I want to buy them. I want to try all them. I want to try all these different girths because there's so many girths out there. And I think this is one of those where – the conclusion for this girth shouldn't be whether people love or hate it. It should be whether your horse loves or hates it. Because I think when we're talking about the total saddle fit girth, this is really going to depend um, on your horse's shape. Because you are going to find people whose horse's body shape probably doesn't work with this girth and they really hate it. And you're going to find people whose horse's body shape does work well with this girth and they like it. So the other concern I heard about um, or saw when it came to the total saddle fit girth was that the 
piece on the base of the chest, and this is where some of that um, concern about too much pressure on the horse's chest came from, was that the loop, they're like, right, it's got like a swish in it, and then that swish in the center wasn't making even contact, and that only a small portion was making contact, and then the curve was gapping. This is not an issue. I own this girth or I own the cinch version. It's not an issue I have with my horse, but it would, again, goes back to that pressure distribution. If you've got just a thin line where that pressure is being brought across the chest, yes, that's going to be more painful than it being on a wider um, girth. But this actually made me think, jumping all around on the girth conversation, you own one, because I know I bought you one for Christmas, the over the breast, the really wide one. (laughs) Yes, the girth with the chest plate on it to protect you while you're galloping. I started to question that design because I know for sure those gap in the back and that those ones probably aren't putting pressure equally, are distributing it well on the base of the horse's um, barrel. You own it. What do you think? I have used it a few times. At first, it was kind of hard to get my horse used to it because it's just a big chunk of leather against her abdomen, and she was already not a huge fan of girths to begin with. So (laughs) trying to be like, no, 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 trust me, more of it is better. I promise. (laughs) Took a little bit of convincing. No, I just want to know how it worked on her. I'm curious how it fit. So there is gapping in the back. There is a little bit of gapping where it makes contact where like the first probably four inches of it Mm -hmm. against her body so probably the normal width of a girth traditional girth is it makes contact but then there's nothing else securing the back end of it so there's a little bit of air and so that pressure that we're thinking is being distributed it isn't because there's nothing securing those like the bigger portions to it to her body do you find that she went the same in that one or that she went differently Besides her being irritated. <laughs> the first time we rode in it, she was lifting her core like no tomorrow. Oh, perfect. It was, <laughs> it was wonderful. But now that she's gotten used to it, I can't really tell a difference. Okay. So she's adjusted to it then. Yeah, she's adjusted to it. Back to the total saddle fit girth. I originally purchased one for my horse, Nim. And the reason being as he is, he's stocky, but he's super short. He has a super short back. Um, His barrel is super condensed and I ride him Western mostly. And my Western cinches were folding over right behind where the elbows would go because they would be so close. And the way a Western saddle fits, it fits a little bit different than an English saddle where you actually do put place it on the shoulder and so that cinch is a little bit closer to that elbow and for him it was bending and there's no way that could be comfortable to have a cinch folded up um, and bent in your elbow so I made the decision to go to the total saddle fit cinch it seems to work perfect for him I have no rubbing issues there's no saddle sores he doesn't seem to be bothered by it the way it you know sits and touches him I've checked the pressure it seems to distribute pressure fairly evenly um, across his barrel so I I think it's a great a great cinch um, and I'm going to continue to use it but I'm also going to know that this isn't for all horses would you buy it as a regular girth for one of your other horses maybe so I did find one study from 2013 which was conducted by several vets, um, which included Rachel Murray, Russell Guire, Mark Fisher, and Vanessa Fairfax. Um, And they put, this is the only study, and they even claim it, that put pressure mats underneath girths. So this is where I really have a hard time with people making this claim about total saddle fit girths, is that no one's done the research to say this pressure is working the way you say it's working, that it is putting pressure unevenly because this, there's only one study, and it wasn't even looking at total saddle fit girths, um, but it was looking at similar girths. They had horses that were ridden in a traditional girth and then an atomically designed girth to determine which girth applied more pressure, where was that pressure applied, and how did it affect the horse's range of motion. And in this study, they found that the traditional girth applied either 22 to 14 percent depending on the side this is a huge thing we got to work on folks the left side of the girth often applied more pressure than the right side of the girth because of how we tighten them and that they were applying 22 on the left side and 14 percent on the right side greater pressure than the atomical girth and that the atomical girth provided 6 to 11 percent greater forelimb motion 10 to 20% greater 
hind limb motion and 4% greater flexion in the knee and 3% greater flexion in the hock. Okay. Now, so this study does find that that atomically designed girth performed, made the horse perform better, less pressure, and that they were, had a higher range of motion. The little caveat to this is that Vanessa Fairfax works for Fairfax Saddles, um, who have their own performance girth, which looks gorgeous, by the way. I probably would buy the Fairfax girth. The study was published in veterinary journals. It was peer-reviewed. This is a real study, but it was looking at the people who own the girth hired hired out the research, if that makes sense. No, that's actually going to tie into my next one whenever we move on to that one. But that's interesting. Fairfax comes up a bit in these anatomical discussions. So I don't know if that's good or bad, right? Like, is Fairfax the only one doing the research to prove their equipment works? Or is Fairfax, you know, do they have researchers in their pocket? I, I, I'm i going to say they're the only company out there right now doing the research. I'm going to, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt that no one else is doing this research. So they're, they are, and their products look pretty good. I'm going to be honest. Um, right. And there's enough products out there right now revolving around anatomical stuff and like being fitting to the horse and allowing them to move more freely without like putting these pressure points on that I feel there's plenty of other companies that should be doing these research studies that they aren't. They just are not doing them. Yeah. And I, I think that's a common theme I keep finding when it comes to all horse products. We are not doing the research to support any of these claims. I mean, this goes back no. to, back to our boot episode. We don't even know if boots work. Like, <laughs> we spend all this money on these products, and we actually have no idea if they work or are doing the job that we think they're doing. So it's just, like, super frustrating that companies continue to spend money on new and new designs. They charge an arm and a leg for these products, yet there's no research to back it up. No, I agree 100%. It's very frustrating. Uh, it's just so much, it just makes me think of all the things that I've purchased over the years, right? So much money that I've wasted purchasing products that now I'm thinking about, I didn't fully understand what maybe their purpose was at first and how they worked. And now that I'm looking at how they work and how they function. They're not even doing that correctly. No, I mean, where companies are spending more money on marketing than they are on research. And at the end of the day, they benefit from it and we lose and our horses lose because we wasted so much money on products that aren't so much money aren't what they claim to be so i am going to for this one um when it comes to the total saddle fit or that shoulder relief style girth i'm going to continue to use them i will probably at some point purchase a new girth for my other horse after i purchase her brand new mattis pad (laughs) (laughs) she'll probably get a new girth at some point even though she gets ridden like you know once in a blue moon i want her to be super comfortable when those days happen do monitor your girth fit do monitor your horse's response because every horse's body shape is different so these girths might not fit your horse the same way they fit my horse that carries over really well to what my next tack trend is and that's anatomical bridles right Mm, yes yes i own none (laughs) i own one and i'm a little upset the one that i purchased um so i think the very first anatomical bridle that we really saw that was getting pushed across the markets and that was just making appearance everywhere was the miklum bridle Mm mm-hmm in which they boasted about how the design of it was so it avoided the pressure points in sensitive nerves, facial nerves across the horse's face, as well as reducing pressure across the pole, which we all know is a pressure point. Mm-hmm. The one that came across the market that I bought was the Miklum Bridle. And when I got it, it's not a super cheap bridle. I mean, granted, nothing with horses are cheap, but you know, it, I expected something out of it. And I have seen a slight improvement and slight difference with my horse with it. But the overall quality of the Miklum bridle and the leather quality, I'm a little disappointed in. Is it's, it's a little cheap for the amount that you pay for it. Yeah, that's, I, I'm shocked by that. I thought it would have been a really nice quality bridle. It's not, which is frustrating <laughs> because that's the one that you get pushed on you and is the most affordable of them because now you have all these bigger brands and all these bigger names making them. You have PS of Sweden is, has their own. Steuben has their own. There's Stockholm. I think there's another brand called Scholm. Yeah. They have their own. And our favorite friends of Fairfax Saddles, they have their own. And Fairfax, in this whole bridle industry with anatomical bridles, from what I could find, 
the only ones out of any research to back up their bridal. Not surprised. <laughs> Not surprised, right? Isn't It's weird. I can't believe you mentioned Fairfax and the girth topics. I was like, oh my God, I just read about them. <laughs> that, yeah, it's funny. I mean, it's true. They're the only ones. And it makes me actually really want to support this company right now. It is. But I'm having a hard time. So there's a lot of thoughts I have on the bridal situation in which I support anatomical bridals. I think based off of the some of the studies I've seen that just – you just look up um, vet studies that just tell you about the horse's face and just their basic anatomy. Yes. And that's kind of what I'm basing this off of is I'm sure. putting together like my own ideas and everything is that if you go and look at the horse's anatomy and across their face is they do have a lot of very sensitive structures. Their nose being one major, very sensitive and vulnerable place that we have to be very careful with our nose bands. What's in their nose is very soft and pliable and can be bent and broken and damaged incredibly easily. And then on top of that, we know that they have pressure points in their pole where your crown piece goes directly across. You know against their mm-hmm. ears, they're very sensitive. They have a lot of nerves there, which crown pieces also put pressure against. And then across their face, obviously anything directly against your bones is going to be a lot more sensitive than something that has a little bit of meat in between the pressure and the bone itself. And so with all this put together, the anatomical bridles, they make sense because they tend to have wider pole pieces – or pieces they tend to have wider crown pieces <laughs> across the pole <laughs> with cutouts around the ears that allow for free movement against the ears and minimal pinching there which my mare had a huge issue with traditional bridles and she really does appreciate having that cut out i've seen a huge difference in her she used to shake her head so much anytime and i could always trace it back to that she was getting pinched by the bridle in the, against the sensitive ear of her skin or the sensitive skin against her ear my gosh i'm getting so caught up and then there's also um a lot of the anatomical bridles, they adjust where the cheek pieces are so it avoids those cheekbones. Mm-hmm. But my biggest issue with them is PS of Sweden, Stockholm, I think even Steuben does it, is they all have these built-in flash attachments, which I disagree with. I don't think you need a built-in flash attachment that you have to automatically, like you buy, you can't remove this flash. It's just a part of the bridle, part of the noseband that goes against like the bottom of the bit you know you have your traditional nose band and then you have another piece that is this anatomical flash connection which i think is very contradictory in its own that oh yeah 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 yeah. Yeah, so a a lot of these bridles that you have the ability to buy is sometimes you can find ones that don't have the flash attachment but the ones you see commonly being pushed and advertised have the built-in flash attachment which in its of its own is not an improvement to design and showing an improvement in training it's just showing an improvement in restraining yeah that's interesting i Hadn't noticed that that was so common in these bridles, but you're right. They all have that. And it's weird because I don't fully understand that design because the flash works because you're closing the nose down, but that only goes over the back half. But maybe, I guess the nose, I don't know. It's weird. It looks like it wouldn't work, but also looks like it does work. I It's, it's an odd one. It is an odd one. And I don't have a f- I don't think I have enough information to fully form an opinion on it and say if it does its job and what it's they're saying it does mm-hmm. because I just don't want to buy a, I that's not a product I'm interested in purchasing you know ones without the flash attachment I like I appreciate the trying to make the nose band go up higher and avoid the cheekbones altogether I really appreciate that but when it comes in with the built-in flash I disagree I don't think that's necessary well and um this is a different topic for a different day but flashes the way I view them is that's a temporary training solution you should only be using a flash for maybe a week or two max a month so purchasing a bridle at that cost that has a permanent flash that's a waste of money for a bridle you're only going to be using for a couple weeks yes it is um one of the things I was noticing though is a lot of this anatomical research is relatively new, actually. One of the books that I really like to read is called Training Three-Day Event Horse and Rider, and it's by uh, James Walford, Jimmy Walford. Never heard of him. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Someone's going to believe that. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. I totally know who he is. I have his books on my shelves. Don't worry, guys. <laughs> it's an older book. It was published in 1995, and when I was going through it, he has a section that talks about um, tack, and he does a really good breakdown of the different breastplates and does a lot of discussions about the bit and how the horse uses their body and how like our gear interferes with them. But in his book, the only things he breaks down and talks about with the bridle is the nosebands in the bits. There's no discussion 20 years ago about how the bridle, the rest of it fits the horse's face. There's no discussion about it. So we have come a far ways. Like we are making leaps and bounds and 
in the future, I will be purchasing another anatomical bridle. I'm just going to be doing a lot of research to find which one like appropriately fits the horse's face and which one doesn't have, you know, kind of funky training gimmicks built into it. Yeah. And I do really love that idea because this is something I see all the time is first off, we there is proper bridle fit and this includes making sure that that brow band fits your horse and it might not be that your brow band is too small but the way your particular brow brow band sits on your horse's <laughs> head maybe pulling that crown piece into their ears and that is something I see all the time as being a huge issue is that you've got to keep those ears clear and that's why I really like that um, I haven't purchased one yet but I do like those atomical anatomical crown pieces I like the idea of protecting the sensitive parts of their their ears I'm not super worried about my nose band I'm more worried about my crown piece I'm worried about both I think both are incredibly important but I've also never really ridden with a super tight nose band I am very generous with my nose bands and so the places that I see the most friction in my everyday riding it was with the crown piece and the ears because that's not something you can adjust really you need to buy like, so it will fit your horse, the appropriate size, because you have minimal adjustment, whereas the nose band, you have a lot more leeway in how you can adjust it. Yeah. And I, um, you know, the crank nose band, we can talk about that a different day, but uh. that was really popular for a while. Um, and I, that was another one where we went down that road and uh, looking back, it's like, well, that was dumb. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, and the issue is sometimes with these crank nose bands is you buy the bridle and it comes with one built in. Yeah. Is it's built into the bridle. And so that's just your everyday use. Because you didn't buy a regular Cavasson to go on your bridle. You bought the bridle and then now you realize it has a crank nose band. Like so many dressage bridles are just built in with that crank nose band. Yeah. Yeah. That's – as this tax and these things become more and more trendy, it becomes harder and harder to find something that is more traditional or maybe a little tra- – you know, a little anatomical but basically traditional. Because I do still float on that. I'm a pretty traditionalist when it comes to most of – of my tack. I wouldn't say I'm a traditionalist. I am just, I like simplicity. Yeah. Keep it simple. That's, so I like these anatomical or anatomical designs. I really like, I like the cutouts for the ears. I like the cutouts for, you know, with the girths and stuff. However, that new Steuben girth has way too much going on with it. Just break it down. Make, keep it simple. Which brings us to my last item, which is one of those things where I do not understand today's current trend. So I'm going to be talking about stirrups. So yesterday's trend was to add a little bit of bend to your stirrup, right? They have the rubber caps on the side of the stirrups that allow the base to be bent a little bit. Today's trend appears to be carbon cheese graters. And I'm sorry, I (laughs) do not understand the carbon cheese grater trend. They are... Oh my god. So they do ugly. Look like cheese graters. They are cheese graters. Those, I am sorry to whoever uses the free jump stirrups, but those things are hideous. For $300, those are the ugliest things I've ever seen. I don't even understand. Like, they come in really pretty colors. I will give you that. The Bordeaux one is gorgeous. I love a good wine color, a good deep <laughs> raspberry, a good deep wine. Beautiful. Just beautiful. But the rest of it, it, it uh, no, out the door. I'm sorry. You's- They're so clunky. They're so clunky. I So I will admit that I will probably in the n- somewhat near future purchase a pair of carbon stirrups because I am interested in getting something wider and the ones I truly want are like $300 and are a little too weirdly designed because I do prefer the traditional shape. Um, I currently ride in the Herm Springer um, bendy stirrups, the original ones. These stirrups are like 10 years old, but I I love them. I think they work great. However, I have to be really conscious of my position for them to work well. Oh, really? Yes. So these stirrups were designed as a way to reduce the strain on knees and ankle joints. Um, They are touted as a really good way to alleviate knee, hip, um, and ankle pain and encourage softness by reducing the impacts on your joints, your cartilage, and your ligaments. So we're seeing a lot of older riders choose to ride in these Herm Springer or just there's a thousand and one uh, bendy stirrups now available on the market. But I do have the original Herm Springer ones, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, and I somewhat apologize. Okay. Um, <laughs> but so there, that's where these come from, is trying to reduce the amount of shock that that stirrup has some give to it. 
The problem with them is that if you have a really weak leg or you're someone that really braces into your heel and in your joints, that stirrup is going to give you all the give in the world to let you drag your heels down as far as you want. And that I hate. I am very opposed, like, I hate the phrase heels down because I think it gets abused and misused constantly. Yes. Your heels, watch any dressage rider, any jumper rider, the majority of their ride, their heels are level to maybe two to three inches lower than the toe. I mean, not even three inches, like two inches lower. It's a slight, slight dip in the heel because, right, we don't want our toes to be the lowest thing. We don't want our stirrup to slide all the way back, get caught on your ankle. I understand the heels down concept, but heels down actually means loose ankles is what you should be striving for is that you have the ability to flex your ankle like before a big jump you're going to see that your heels go way down for that moment and then they're going to soften back up over the jump and then you may go way down into them again as you land but that comes from a soft joint soft hips soft knees soft ankles not from a heel shoved down and that's where there's some confusion and these stirrups the bendy stirrups If you don't already have a good lower leg, a soft lower leg, I'm not talking about a strong lower leg, but a soft lower leg and soft joints, these stirrups you're going to find are going to give you way too much give and you're going to find yourself locking in your knees and your ankles. And that's where there's a lot of complaints from older riders with arthritis who originally bought these stirrups in order to, you know, because they believe they're going to be pain relieving, bought them and found out they were actually way more uncomfortable because they have weaker, um, stiffer legs to begin with. And they were able to basically just push those stirrups to the edge of where they can bend and flex. Um, and that led to on them being uncomfortable. And the issue wasn't so much the stirrup as it was their leg. Okay, that makes a lot of sense, actually. I wonder if it affects also their stability and how stable they feel in the saddle. Yes, it does. That's a huge thing. People are complaining about their balance and their position when they're using these stirrups a ton. But most of those riders do admit to having knee issues or arthritis. So as you and I I totally agree with them. I, I would promote if you are a rider with knee issues or arthritis or any pain in the knees, ankles, I would promote using a stirrup with a wider tread. Something more traditional that's stiff, doesn't have the bend, and has that wider tread so that you can't tip your foot off the back. Um, Because that's those traditional English stirrups, like the traditional Phyllis irons, are fairly narrow. And you see a lot of riders just sort of tipping their feet off the back of them. But they are limited because that stirrup doesn't have that extra give on how much they can tip. And you start to feel it. And that's the one thing with those Phyllis irons is you feel your tip and you feel your stiffness where the bendy Herm Springer ones hide that a little bit more and you don't feel how weak you actually are. I personally have never really looked into my stirrups. I just, I have the same stirrups I've had since we got them from the 4-H tax sale so many years ago. Yeah. And I think there's a lot to be said for the traditional stirrups. You do. I don't think stirrups are one of those items you should be purchasing to help your position. Um, You know, there's maybe some, like I said, I'm supportive of wider stirrups, but that's about it Um, because I think stirrups is one of those areas where you need to be responsible for your own joints and not rely on a piece of equipment to make you softer. Yeah. I, you know, if you want to look at wide stirrup leathers to make your legs stronger, I think I'm I'm supportive of that because strength and softness are two different things. Your tack cannot make you softer. Your tack can help you be stronger um, and have a stronger base of support. We can always be stronger. And if you can find equipment that helps you in that realm, I, I, I'm i supportive of that. Not that you don't have to have a strong lower leg because if you have a weak lower leg, those stirrups leathers are only going to help you so much. So one of the things I did find, I found a blog that – for a girl, um, this is called, her blog is called No Bucking Way, which I think is cute. <laughs> <laughs> and she had recently purchased the um, a new pair of those free jump stirrups. And her conclusion was that, so what the stirrups claim is that they tell us that the center of gravity of these stirrups is set towards the front, which in turn encourages you to keep your heels down. And she loved this. She thought it was much easier to keep her heels down in these stirrups than she did in her Springers, the ones I use. 
um, and that the additional cheese grater grips really allowed her to get her heels down. And I hated this conclusion because, again, <laughs> and that she posted pictures – and the picture was only a moment. A picture in a moment can look so bad versus the next moment. Didn't love her heel position, to be honest. Um, I don't think, again, you should be using your stirrups so that you can hang off the back of them. I, that does not make sense to me. So I'm honestly going to be avoiding free jump stirrups because I'm not spending that much money on something that ugly. That's pretty much the biggest conclusion. <laughs> But I also, I do not notice a difference when I switch between different stirrups. I do still ride in traditional Phyllis irons without any bend in them. And I do not notice the difference between those and my Herm Springers because I have put so much effort into making sure I am soft. And that that is like the first thing I work on when I get in the saddle is am I soft? Are my heels, you know, open and soft and absorbing? And so there's, I don't feel a difference from one pair of stirrups to the other. No, I would agree. That's... I like your conclusion. I appreciate it. Yeah. So I'm going to continue to use them. I'll probably use those ones forever. Um, I'm really sad that it, their wider ones are so expensive. They have these bow stirrups. Gosh, everything is just so expensive. It's so expensive. But then back to your point of then they add a half a dozen other items to it that I'm like, I'm not not here for the weird angle, the tip to the side. Like, I just want a little bit of bend in my stirrup and a wider tread. That's all. You, the only way you can get that is you have to get that with like the 20 add-ons that you didn't want. Exactly. Yeah. I just want like two additional things too. And so that's really, really frustrating when it comes to a lot of this gear and a lot of the gear that I am riding in, these stirrups, they appear to be gone from the market. I have to do a lot of research to find the traditional ones. Um, it's, yeah, it's frustrating to watch these things change um, and to watch these pieces of equipment be abused or misunderstood um, or misunderstand them right yourself, especially when you find <laughs> out you were the victim of the scam. Um, that can be really frustrating. Oh, I know. Gosh. And I know there's probably going to be a dozen other of these tech trends that I'll probably end up falling victim to and being all for it. And then I'll do a little bit more research and be like, oh, never mind. Take it back. My bad. And I mean, with a lot of these, though, sometimes you have to fall the victim. You have to get it home and try it because your horse is not built the same as everyone else's horse. I am a big proponent of know your horse. Horses are great communicators. They will tell you if something is working or not. You just have to be willing to listen um, and be willing to put in that extra effort because I think that's where a lot of us get hung up is we know, you know, it's not perfect, but I bought it, so I'm going to use it. You know, that may, as convenient as that is as an an of an answer, it may not be the best answer for your, you and your horse. So you had a question you wanted to ask me. Yes. What is your... <laughs> So What's I've been back on the Facebook scrolling for memes because that's what I do when I'm uh, perhaps in work meetings. <laughs> <laughs> now that our meetings are all, yeah, on, you know, we're all on Zoom calls, I may or may not be scrolling Facebook. Okay. So this, the question for this week is which button do you press? You've got six buttons. And if you press one of them, you get this item. All right. Listen, though. Okay. For all your options. And you're welcome to ask me to repeat because I do. you do have six options. Great. I'm only going to hear the first two. <laughs> okay. Option one, free hay for life. Option two, free training for life. Option three, any horse you want for free. Option four, million dollar tack shopping spree. Option five, indoor riding arena. And option six, no show fees for life. Uh, I think I saw this around Facebook too, or at least I saw like a version of it. Mm -hmm. I have a little bit of a toss up, but I think it's going to come in. I want free hay for life, you know? Yeah. My horses eat a lot. I need them. I need to get that bill off my chest. Because then I get, you know, if they're nice, fat, and happy, then I can spend that money on show fees or... I don't need a million dollars worth of tack. I mean, I could sell it and keep the million dollars, but that's just way too much effort. Any horse I want for free, any horse I want for free is probably going to have thoroughbred in it and they're going to eat me out of house and home. And so I'm going to still need that free hay. And then free training for life. I don't know. I feel like Google's doing me pretty good right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was definitely between the free training for life 
um, and the free hay for life. And I thought with free hay, does that mean I can have as many horses as I want? <laughs> like, <laughs> Maybe you can feed as many as you want. They can all be fed and happy. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I might have to hit that free hay for life button too. I think your logic's pretty sound. Okay, now what if we change out that free hay for life, or not free hay, let's say you have free hay for life or no more vet bills ever. Oof. Yeah, bro. Um, <laughs> that, whoo. I know. If I had free vet bills, do you know how often the vet would be here for like chiropractic, x-rays? <laughs> like we would be like, bring it. Bring the MI, MRI machine. We're doing it. Like, get them in. We would do, like, everything. It'd be like that one episode off of Parks and Rec where um, Andy and April go to the, the doctors and they get, like, absolutely everything done. Yes, that's a thousand percent what would happen to all my horses. All right, guys, we're getting everything now. Now that it's free. Everything. <laughs> I mean, the thing with free hay is you're going to use that every month. You may not have to use your vet every month. <laughs> you may. In your case, you do. That's true. But My vet. for me, free hay is always going to win because I don't well, have the vet bills as often as you do. Last year, my vet was out here every month. <laughs> at one of the – either the barn or the house every single month. Oh, I'm so sorry for your poor bank account. Oh, my gosh. Oh, no, it's actually worse this year um, because what ha- the things that happened this year cost a lot more money. I've seen her a lot That's less, true. but the things cost <laughs> a lot more money. See, free hay and free vet care when you're dealing with retired and semi-retired horses, those both of those rack up so quickly because <laughs> – that's all they do is eat and uh, rack up vet bills. So they do nothing else. <laughs> they don't need no indoor arena. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> and they don't they need, need the million dollar tax free. And they don't need show fees. So yeah, wow, that's a good one. I'm torn. I, I can't decide on that one. Well, and I guess on this note, we'll sign off for today. Thank you guys so much for sticking with us and listening to our podcast this week. If you want to keep up with us, you can follow us on Instagram at mudstuds underscore skullcaps. Or if you have questions or anything you want us to discuss on our podcast, you can send us emails at mudstudsskullcaps at gmail.com. And if you are listening on Apple iTunes, don't forget to leave a review. This is how other listeners help, uh, you know, how people find our, our show and know that it's a good one. Also, hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss our episodes. We are getting back on schedule. We promise it has been a couple crazy weeks here and there for Robin. Um, <laughs> so we're getting back on schedule, but that subscribe button will make sure that you don't miss any, any episodes. So with that, guys, stay safe, stay classy, and stay in the saddle. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.